Okay, so let's start. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining this session of the virtual seminars in economic theory. Uh, today, we're very happy to have uh, Jacobo Perego from Colombia, who is going to talk about uh, competitive markets for personal data. Uh, it's joint work with uh, Simone Galberti and Tian Hao Liu. And uh, we're pleased to have our guest panelists, Kevin He and Jitong Zhu. Uh, the format of the seminar is as follows. We have a 60-minute uh, presentation with time for interim questions, both from the panelists and the uh, and um, and the audience. Also, if you want, uh, you can also uh, post uh, questions from the chat. Um, at the end, there will be an opportunity to ask also questions live in the Q and A session. At the end, uh, also to tell you that the talk is recorded. Um, before I hand over to Jacopo, let me announce that uh, we're going to conduct uh, you know the next workshop in economic. Theory, which is in the memory of Milton Macris, is going to take place on March 21 and 22 at the University of Durham in the UK. Uh, we have a great list of speakers, uh, just to, to name them. It's going to be Jose Apesteguia, uh, Rosel Argenzano, Sarah Oster, David uh, de la Cretaz, Federico Esenique, Jan Knapfle, Alessandro Pavan, and uh, Anna Sancto Hanser. Sorry for butchering your names. Um, okay, so, and also we will also announce the, the, the list of uh, virtual seminars for the next year uh, in due course. Uh, so I think we're ready. So Jacobo, the, uh, the mix is yours. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, especially, I'm especially thankful to Ji Dong and Kevin uh, for, for uh, being here. Uh, and being uh, the panelists. Uh, so this is, uh, today I'm presenting joint work with Simone Galperti and uh, Tian Hao Liu, who is uh, with us uh, on, online and uh, is going to help me uh, address the questions and is going to monitor the chat. All right, so today I would like to tell you <clears throat> a bit about uh, uh, competitive markets for personal data. Um, uh, as a way of motivating the paper, uh, let me start by noticing that uh, consumers uh, today supply uh, one of the most crucial input for the modern economy, uh, that is to say their personal data. Uh, think of, for example, digital advertisements, um, the you know, multi-billion dollar industry that has been created uh, uh, exploiting using uh, consumer data has a productive input in this industry. Uh, now, uh, what's peculiar about uh, um, this, uh, this arrangement uh, is that uh, while consumers supply such an important input, they often have very limited control over who uses uh, their data and how uh, their data is used. And when uh, it happens to be the case that their data is used, uh, they're often only imperfectly compensated uh, uh, in return. Uh, for example, they may receive a service in exchange for data as, as in a form of a barter, or in the worst case scenario, they just get expropriated, um, as it is the case often in the uh, uh, when it comes to data broker. Um, now, this status quo has uh, drawn the attention of, uh, uh, of uh, policymakers and scholars in economics and law uh, and it has been uh, um, hypothesized that uh, uh, the status quo this, this status quo could lead to uh, market failures. Um, so the the question that we would like to uh, ask in this paper is uh, whether uh, a a market uh, in which uh, consumers owned uh, their personal data, so they had property rights uh, on their data, and a market that perhaps is even perfectly competitive, like this ideal uh, market that we could imagine, whether such a market could avoid uh, these problems, could achieve efficiency. So that's sort of like the high level motivation for this paper. So more specifically, what we do with this paper uh, is the following. Uh, we, we write down a very stylized competitive economy in which consumers own their data and can decide whether they want to sell it uh, to a platform uh, or not. The platform uh, um, uses the data that it acquires from consumers to interact them uh, with a merchant that wants to sell products to the consumers. Now, uh, the paper has uh, two main contributions. 
the first one is that we highlight um, a novel market failure for this uh, economy that uh, uh, I just described very loosely. And this market failure uh, happens despite the fact that uh, we took this caution approach in which consumers are given property rights, and despite the fact that the economy is assumed to be perfectly competitive. The market failure st stems from um, the pooling externalities, what I, what I like to think of as pooling externalities. I'll explain to you what I mean with that in a second, which are enabled by how the platform endogenously uses the data of the consumers. And this is, relates to an idea that we uh, developed with Simone and with another co-author, Sasha Levkun, on an earlier paper uh, that we worked on a, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, this externality that I just mentioned is unrelated to uh, another externality that the literature has identified, which I like to think of as a learning externality. Uh, and the papers that you see on the right-hand side of, of the slide have, uh, have discussed how this externality can create uh, problems. So the first contribution of the paper is to highlight a negative feature of this, of this economy. Uh, it can be uh, inefficient. In the second part of the paper, we propose three alternative solutions that correct this inefficiency and, rest, and, and, and make sure that the, uh, the economy is uh, uh, is achieving efficiency. Today I will discuss three uh, three ideas. Um, the first one is the introduction of a data tax. The second one is the introduction of a data union, and the last one is uh, this idea of uh, making uh, data markets more complete. Okay, so this is of course very vague at this stage, uh, but you get a sense of what uh, uh, the direction is, and I'll, I'll explain in details what I mean by 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 this uh, by these things. All right, so. Without further ado, I would uh, I would like to jump uh, straight into uh, into the mode. Um, so the we're right we're trying to write the very stylized uh, data economy. In this economy, we will have three sets of agents: one merchant, one platform, and a unit mass of consumers. Uh, the merchant is in the business of selling widgets or products to consumers. And let's assume for simplicity that the merchant has a zero marginal cost. Uh, each consumer instead has a unit demand for the widget that is uh, sold by the merchant. And we denote uh, her willingness to pay, the consumer's willingness to pay by omega. And omega belongs in a finite set. There is a population of consumers, I told you. Uh, let me denote by uh, Q bar, uh, the distribution of willingness to pay. In, uh, in this population of consumers. Each consumer owns uh, its own data. What does it mean? It, it means that it owns what we like to think of as a data record, which is a list of personal characteristics uh, of a consumer, such as your, your zip code, your gender, your education level, and whatnot. Um, and this list of characteristics, this data record, uh, if sold to the platform, by the consumer will reveal verifiably and fully the underlying willingness to pay of the consumer, what I called Omega. And on top of that, will allow the platform to intermediate this consumer with the merchant. The model has two periods. In the first period, uh, data records are traded. I'll explain how in the next slide. And in the second period, data records are used by the platform. And I will explain how in two slides. So yeah, a quick question. So yes. if I don't sell my data to the platform, then I cannot interact with the merchant. That's the assumption, right? That is correct. And I will comment on this uh, two more times uh, before the model ends. So okay. I'll, 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 I'll not engage right now, but I'll, this is an important assumption. So let me explain to you how the data trade um, happens. Platform, the platform and the consumers trade uh, data records in a competitive market, in a market that is assumed to be competitive. What does it mean? Uh, we have a demand side and a supply side. The demand side is the platform. The platform uh, demands data records. And for each record of type Omega that the platform buys, it has to pay a price, P of Omega. On the supply side, um, 
if a type omega consumer sells a record, she is, she receives a compensation, a monetary compensation for the platform, a prize, which is denoted again by P of M. Notice that this compensation is on top of whatever service the platform offer to the consumer, in particular, the ability to be interacted with the merchant and possibly buying a product from, from the merchant. Notation-wise, I will denote by zeta the decision of a consumer uh, of selling uh, her record, okay, the probability that with which a consumer of type omega sells her record to the platform. Now, going back to what Ji Dong was asking, what happens if a consumer decides not to sell her record? We assume that by doing so, the um, consumer foregoes uh, the possibility of being interacted with the merchant by the platform. So it foregoes the platform service and obtains a reservation utility which is exogenous and it's denoted by R of omega. Okay, I'll, again, I'll, as I told you, I'll come back to this once once more in the in two, in two slides. So this is how the trade happens. Let's go to period two. The data are used. What does it mean? At the beginning of period two, the platform has acquired a database. What's a database? A database is just a vector of quantities. Each dimension of this vector tells me the quantity of data records of type omega that the platform has acquired in the previous period. Given this database, you should think of it as a prior if you want, the platform acts as an information designer. What does it mean? It means that it sends the merchant a signal about each consumer in its database. And given the signal received, the merchant chooses, charges each consumer a fee, which we denote by A. Given the fee ch uh, chosen by the merchant, the consumer then chooses whether to purchase the product or not. Let me tell you what the payoffs of, this, uh, of the interaction in the second period are. They're very standard. The consumer uh, payoff uh, is not by little u. This is the fee of the merchant. This is the type of the consumer willingness to pay. And the payoff captures the trading surplus. If uh, uh, the, the, if omega is higher than than the fee, then the consumer will buy and will obtain a surplus of uh, omega minus a. If not, she will not buy and she will walk away with the payoff of zero. Uh, the merchant uh, payoff is only by pi, and that's just profits. Remember, there is no cost, so the profit here is the fee times whether or not the uh, consumer uh, purchase uh, purchases the widget. And finally, the platform's payoff v, little v, is assumed to be a linear combination between the um, consumer surplus and the merchant's profit. Now, I told you that the, um, the platform acts as an information designer, and the description in these three bullets uh, essentially tells us uh, how this you know, interaction between the, uh, the platform and the merchant uh, occurs. But you know, this is a problem that we have studied in all sorts of possible directions. So we know a lot about this problem. And in particular, we know, um, at, when I say we, I mean us collectively, uh, um, we know that we can write this problem in a very convenient way. Uh, we can write this problem as if the platform, rather than choosing an information structure, was choosing a direct recommendation mechanism that we denote by X. A direct recommendation mechanism maps uh, types of consumers into random recommendation for the merchant to solve the following information design problem, a problem in which the platform picks a recommendation mechanism X to maximize its own payoff, little v, but of course it has to make sure that the recommendation it sends to the merchant are incentive compatible. That is to say, if I recommend, you to if I recommend the merchant to, to charge fee A, uh, the merchant doesn't want to charge the fee A prime. Okay, this is an obedience constraint. So this is extremely standard. Um, and so perhaps if you want, uh, one uh, one angle of novelty in this paper is that we are analyzing a very standard information design problem. This is in fact, just like BBM 2015, uh, Bergman, Bruce and Morris, uh, with, the, with the twist that uh, this information design problem uh, has an endogenous prior, 
Q. It's not quite a prior, uh, but it's effective. It's essentially, it is as if it was a prior. It's, it has an endogenous Q that is determined in period one uh, in the context of a competitive model. Now, let me close the model um, and define the equilibrium notion. So before doing that, uh, let me remind you of the four uh, endogenous variables that I have introduced. We have a vector of prices, one price for each type of data record. We have uh, a vector of decisions uh, for the consumers, one for each type of record. This is whether they want to sell or not. Q star is the database of the platform. It's a vector of quantities, how many records of each type the platform wants to buy. And X star is the, is the mechanism. And this mechanism is embedding a bunch of things inside. Uh, it's embedding what's the information structure that the, the platform decided to use. It embeds the optimal behavior of the merchant following such information structure. And it also embeds the optimal behavior of the consumer following the fee that the merchant uh, decides to charge. Okay, so it's a it's a very convenient object. Now, this list of uh, of object is an equilibrium of uh, the competitive economy if the following um, uh, conditions are satisfied, which are very standard. The first two conditions refer to the optimality of the platform's behavior. The first condition says that in period one, given the prices p, uh, it better be the case that the platform acquires a database. Q star that is optimal. What does it mean? It means that such database has to maximize the payoff that the platform obtains from owning and using such a database, which is capital V of Q. What is capital V of Q? Remember, it's just the value of the information design problem I described before, minus how much it costs the platform to acquire such a database. So prices times quantities. The second condition says that in period two, given whatever database it has acquired in period one, the platform uh, better choose a mechanism that is optimal, that is to say it solves the information design problem I, I presented to you in the previous slide. Third, consumers have to behave optimally. What does it mean? In, in period one, given the prices that they, they see in the market, and given their expectation of how the platform will use the data that it will acquire, so the mechanism X star, the, the consumers have to optimally decide whether to sell or not. So let's go through this math because I think it's useful to remind ourselves of what's the trade-off that the consumer face. If the Remember that if the consumer does not sell, she uh, walks away with an outside option, which is exogenous and it's out of omega. If instead the consumer sells, she gets two things. She gets a monetary, co monetary compensation, the price. And on top of that, she gets an expected payoff, this formula here, which is the expected payoff that the consumer receives from being interacted by the platform with the merchant, given whatever mechanism the platform has decided to take. The last condition is that market, markets have to clear. Remember, this is a competitive economy. And market clearing here is very standard. It tells us that Supply, demand has to be equal to supply. Demand here is the, the platform, how many quantities the platform demand, and supply is the consumers. Remember Q bar is the exogenous number of uh, uh, quantity of records of a certain type, and, and, and zeta star is the fraction of consumers who decide to sell. There is an implicit assumption here about the symmetry of consumers' behavior given their type, which is inessential, uh, so let me not uh, waste time. So that's the equilibrium definition. Uh, and uh, let me now pause a second and quickly go through some of the main assumptions that we made. Clearly, this is a highly, styl highly stylized model, as you have seen. Uh, I'll, I'm not going to comment on all of these uh, unless you ask me. But perhaps uh, I will try to comment on two. The first one, um, you may have noticed that we are assuming a competitive economy and yet there is a single platform, which seems a little bit schizophrenic. Um, I see this mostly as an expositional choice. Um, the substantive assumption, it's not the fact that there is one platform or two platform, it's the fact that this platform or platforms are price takers. Um, so that is the assumption that we wanna own. 
And we want to we wanna really try to push this economy to its competitive uh, benchmark and see if a competitive, perfectly competitive economy can achieve efficiency. Um, we could have done this with N platforms. Uh, this and we have done a version of this model in an earlier version uh, of the paper that was circulated earlier this year. Um, it it doesn't seem to me, at least, seems to just complicate notation without adding anything substantive. So that's why we go with a single quantum. The second assumption that I uh, can discuss, given that uh, Jidong was asking, is the fact that uh, we are assuming that the outside option that the um, that the consumer receives if she decides not to sell her data is exogenous. Uh, and I want, so this to me is a more substantive assumption in the sense that we don't know, we haven't, we don't know how to relax it. And I think it would be an interesting relaxation to, to explore. Um, and it's substantive because you know, in practice, it's possible there are settings in which the consumer can reach the merchant outside of the platform. Okay, so offline, if you want. And in that case, the outside option may become endogenous. Um, there is a recent paper by uh, Bergman um, uh, and Bonatti um, where they explore this channel, where they explore the interaction online and offline. Um, and, 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 they, and they try to investigate what are the consequences of, the, of this. That's not the direction that we want to explore in this paper. With this being said, if there are no... Uh, uh, yes, sorry, Jacob. Can you go back to the previous slides? I want yes. to... Perhaps you can comment a little bit more on the platform payoff. Yes. The, the startup, the, the exogenous yeah. uh, gamma U and gamma pi. So what kind of like a foundation story in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So very good. So the another stylized, stylistic aspect of the of the model is this this decision of modeling the pl platform's payoff as a linear combination between consumer and uh, and and consumer surplus and merchants profit uh, the idea here uh, at a high level the idea is that the platform is uh, trying to balance two objectives on the one hand the platform wants to make money by charging for example fees to the merchants um and that's why it cares about making sure the merchants make a lot of money. Uh, that's, you know, in a sense, it's a short run objective. In the long run, however, the platform better be uh, making sure that the consumers are happy so that uh, they, they stay on the platform. So the platform also cares uh, about uh, their surplus. So the payoff at the high level tries to capture, tries to capture these two uh, objectives, which are, in my view, kind of, common in uh, uh, in two-sided markets, uh, such as the one that I just described. This so, payoff uh, has so been... For, yeah, please. All right. So for example, if the the gamma pi, the, the profit part, is from the like, commission fee the platform is charging to the seller, then that could also affect the pricing decision of the seller, right? So that will may also affect the information design part uh, so you're thinking about the situation in which the platform charges if, if the if the reason I care about the seller's profit is because I'm making money from them by charging a commission fee, right? Yeah. Put, put transaction commission fee. Yeah. Then that's going to affect the uh, the pricing problem of the seller in the second stage. Um, because now basically the commission fee is imposing uh, additional cost on the seller. Yeah, so I mean the the commission fee is taking away a percentage uh, of the profits that the merchant makes, right? That's how it usually work works, right? They the, they take say you know a percentage of the revenues that the merchant make. Yeah, That's so if the the marginal cost of the product assumed to be zero, then it's always a proportion does not matter. Okay? I see, I see, I see. But whenever the cost is not zero, actually, you know, uh, the yeah. commission fee will amplify the yeah the yeah. effective yeah. cost of the seller. Yeah, and that will interact with the pricing stage, and that may also interact with the information design. Uh, yeah, so so design, I mean, right? th th there is no doubt that. Uh, uh, that this is a you know a restrictive assumption. Uh, and it could interact. I, I, this is something I haven't thought about. Uh, 
what happens if the marginal cost is not zero? What's the interaction with the information design problem? Um, so, so maybe because I'm a IO economist, so then I'm asking yeah, this yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here is the Minokia at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so perhaps that that aspect of the um, of the model we can we can think a little bit about it a bit more uh, to uh, to explore what would be the the consequences. Uh, let me just say one more thing about this is that uh, um, in most of the results I will present today we will not use uh, this assumption. Um, it will be used uh, in uh, um, in the uh, result that characterizes. Uh, the inefficiency um, and and I mean to perhaps we can do better than that perhaps we can just go without this entirely um, but uh, but for for many of the results that we are uh, I'll present uh, this assumption is not going to be used I'll, and I'll tell you when exactly I will be using it. Uh, can I ask one question as well? Yeah, please. It's about the this uh, first assumption, the single platform. <clears throat> so one one element of of competition or one assumption of competition could be free entry, which sort of you know the idea being prices are pushed down to some kind of cost level because of yeah. that. Yeah. You are not exploring that at all, or you are not aiming to explore that at all. You, uh, so so I mean in this in this model, the platform will not make money. I see. So, so if you want that, uh, there's a, there's not going to be incentive uh, for uh, all other platform. For, so, it, so this is a competitive. It's a competitive market. Uh, so, despite there being a single platform, the prices are going to be, um, uh, you know, uh, so that the platform cannot make money in equilibrium. Gotcha. Thanks. All man. right. So, so that's the model. Um, the question of the paper is uh, to ask whether uh, uh, an equilibrium of this economy can efficiently allocate data records uh, between consumers and the platform. Uh, the question is, what do we mean by efficiently? Okay, so let me let me define to you our efficiency benchmark. Let me call an outcome uh, by uh, uh, sorry. Let me call an outcome the pair of a data of a database and the mechanism. Uh, and let me denote by uh, W the total welfare of uh, consumers and the platform. This is defined as follows. Um, these Q of omega are the records of type omega that belong to the platform. X is how the platform uses these records. Uh, U is uh, a much payoff the, uh, the consumers receive from this use. And V is the payoff that the platform uh, earns from this use. Uh, this um, is uh, the remaining uh, quantity of record type omega that are not allocated to the platform, but, but rather remains with the consumers. And R is the outside option that this the payoff that these consumers uh, receive. So this uh, this uh, W is the welfare of consumers and platform. And the Sorry, efficiency. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, please, Kevin. Um... So can, if you could go back one slide, yeah. So it's the sum of consumer and platform, right? So you, I guess you you might imagine that efficiency would be I don't know consumer and producer or something like this because yes. if they produce the widget and we ask whether you efficiently trade the widget versus like not buying when you should be going with the outside option. Uh, yes. Yeah, so talk about why 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 this should be like the benchmark of efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll come. I'll come into social efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I'll comment on this right below this definition. So give me just a second. Uh, it's, I think it's a very natural question. Uh, before that, so given this uh, welfare criterion, W, um, let me de define uh, the notion of constraint efficiency. An outcome uh, is constraint efficient if, if it solves the following problem. In this problem, the planner chooses an outcome, a database and a mechanism, to maximize this criterion, uh, W, the uh, welfare of consumers and platform, subject to two uh, constraints. The first constraint is very obvious. The, pl the planner cannot allocate to the platform more records than those that actually exist in the economy. And second, it has to choose a mechanism that is sequentially rational for the platform in the second period, given the chosen database queue. Let me comment on this uh, notion of efficiency. First of all, let me comment on the qualification of, of this being constrained. What do I mean by that? The planner in this notion cannot force uh, a mechanism on the platform. 
the chosen mechanism has to be again sequentially rational for the platform. The platform has to be willing to take this to choose this mechanism given the uh, the 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 database that the planner uh, chooses. This I see this as a lower bar in the sense that achieving this notion of efficiency, constrained efficiency, it's, it should be easier than achieving this a stronger notion of efficiency and unconstrained efficiency. And because we want to highlight a negative result in this paper, um, uh, this, I think, expositionally allows us to uh, do so in a cleaner way. So that's why we focus attention on constraint efficiency. The second uh, thing that I wanted to say, I think relates to what Kevin uh, was asking before, is that you may have noticed that the planner in this notion of efficiency does, uh, does not account for the merchant profit. Okay, it ignores the merchant profits and only ac account for the consumers and the platform's uh, payoff. Why do we make this assumption? Um, again, here we're setting a lower bar for this economy. The, uh, we are not asking that the economy maximizes social welfare, uh, the welfare of all participants in this economy, but only the welfare of a subset of those participants, the planner and uh, the consumers. And this allows us to uh, uh, present our negative result in a cleaner way. Why is that the case? Because in this model, um, you, you may have noticed that the platform uh, is not selling uh, the database to the merchant. The, the platform here is only acting as an information designer. Uh, it's only providing information to the merchant without charging a price to the merchant. And therefore, by construction, the platform does not fully internalize the merchant's payoff. Therefore, it's unsurprising that there is a source of an inefficiency there in this decision that we make in, in not having the platform charge a price to the merchant. Uh, but the source of inefficiency is very standard. It's, un it's unsurprising. And in a sense, it's gonna distract us from the source of inefficiency that we instead we want to emphasize in this paper that does not arise in the interaction uh, between the platform and the merchant, but rather it arises in the interaction between the platform and the consumers. Now, in the appendix of the new draft that we have, which is not the one you, you guys saw, unfortunately, we have an extension of our main result in which we use social welfare as opposed to the welfare I just defined. Uh, and sh and sh this extension shows that qualitatively the result goes through with an additional sufficient condition. All right, um, now, finally, we got to the part in which we can uh, uh, analyze the equilibrium that I defined uh, a little bit, uh, a, a little while ago. So first of all, let's take care of some like easy, um, easy characterizations. First of all, the equilibrium exists, uh, of the equilibrium of the competitive economy exists. Second, um, the equilibrium prices, P star, in particular, the equilibrium price of a record of type omega, in equilibrium is equal to the marginal value of a type omega record from the perspective of the platform. So this is how much the platform's uh, payoff increases if we allocate an additional type omega record uh, in its database. Mm -hmm. These values, and therefore the equilibrium prices, can be derived as dual solutions of the information design problem. And we have characterized these values in a previous paper, uh, the, the paper that I mentioned before with uh, Simone and Sash. The second uh, property, very basic, which is the one I was uh, discussing before, is that perhaps as a consequence of the previous uh, bullet, the platform in this, in this economy makes no profit. The competition is gonna push profits of the platform down to zero. Uh, therefore, the payoff from using the database is gonna be equal to the cost of acquiring. And thus, because of this reason, if an equilibrium outcome is constraint efficient, remember constraint efficiency, as Kevin was asking, is the sum of platform and consumers' uh, uh, welfare. Because the platform doesn't make any profit, all welfare that, that exists in this notion of constraint efficiency is consumer welfare. And therefore, if an equilibrium outcome is constraint efficient, it means that consumer welfare is maximum. Therefore, the question we ask is, okay, are these equilibrium outcomes constraint efficient? So may maybe this could be another justification for focusing on this. Um, yeah. So we, we try, yeah. It's so not. We, that doesn't make sense. It's not so much you care about. So maybe one answer is it's not so much you care about this particular notion of cultural efficiency, but you care about maximizing consumer welfare. 
Yeah. yeah. So, uh, to, I mean, honestly, we're, we're navigating what's the right way of uh, explaining why we think this is the right notion. Uh, we we have, I think we have good reasons, um, but we I think we have to find a shorter and more effective uh, uh, way of doing it. Uh, but but I think there are there are good reasons. One one is this, as you just noted. Yes, uh, you know, if you're interested in consumer welfare, that is uh, that is a notion that you may want. All right. So, are equilibrium outcomes constraint efficient? Uh, the answer is that equilibrium efficiency depends on how the platform uses the data, and this is kind of the key insight uh, of the whole construction that we we, we made. So, the efficiency depends on how the platform endogenously uses the data. How the platform uses the data in turn depends on what is its objective. So now let me remind you that uh, the objective of the platform is this combination of uh, payoff uh, for, for, for the, for the uh, sorry, profits for the merchant and surplus trading surplus for the consumer. We have the following characterization, which this, and this result depends, you know, going back to uh, Qidong, this result depends uh, on this specific characterization. Uh, sorry, on this specific assumption of P. Um, the result is the following. If the weight that the platform assigns to the merchant's profit is higher than the one it assigns to the consumer surplus, meaning that the platform cares, if you want, relatively more about the merchant than about the consumers, then all equilibria of the economy are constraint efficient. And therefore, as I was saying in the previous slide, consumer welfare is maximum. Conversely, if uh, the platform cares relatively more about the consumers, uh, then equilibria of this economy can be inefficient. And the inefficiency can be uh, as severe as uh, to have consumer welfare being as low as their outside option, Arovank. So let me try to repeat uh, what's going on. The result says that equilibrium, uh, the equilibrium, competitive equilibrium maximizes consumer welfare when the platform cares relatively more about the merchant's payoff. And this may sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive. You may have uh, expected that when the platform cares about consumers, that's when the equilibrium can maximize their uh, wealth. So why is it the case? What is driving this, uh, this result? So I'll explain this. Uh, in three slides, uh, and and I'll um, and I'll go. Uh, the first step in the in providing the intuition for this result is to to provide a character a general characterization of what is efficient and what's not efficient. Okay, and then with this characterization, uh, I will use this characterization to provide intuition for why in these two cases we have efficiency or not. So. Let me introduce this uh, uh, variable psi of omega, which captures uh, the marginal value of a type omega record for the planner. No, rather than being it for the for the platform, this is for the planner. Um, so, in particular, this is the change in 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 welfare uh, w from allocating an additional type in the platform's uh, database. We have the following result, which does not depend on the specific specific V, choice of V, going back to Gidong. And the result is very intuitive and says that an equilibrium outcome is efficient, is constraint efficient, if and only if the following two conditions are, are satisfied. If Q star is positive, meaning that uh, type omega consumers, some of them decide to sell in equilibrium directly to the platform and the platform acquires them, it has to be, it better be the case that uh, this, the, the planner's value for these uh, uh, records is exceeds weekly the uh, social cost of moving those records from consumers to, uh, to the platform. And the social cost here is the fact that you're foregoing the outside option, Arovong. Uh, conversely, if it is the case that not all consumers sell their records, meaning that uh, if uh, some type uh, uh, omega consumers decide not to sell the record, then it better be the case that their outside option is weakly higher than this uh, um, uh, planner's value. Okay, so this is a general characterization of efficiency, which now I'm going to use to explain to you what's the intuition behind the result I just described. 
So to build intuition, uh, let's go back to Bergman, Brooks, and Morris uh, triangle, surplus triangle. So this triangle is showing us the all the possible pairs of consumer surplus and merchant profits that can arise from some uh, obedient mechanism in the problem I described. When the platform cares relatively more about um, the merchant's profit because of and, and because of the linearity of its preferences, I can plot in different curves of the platform and you'll see that the optimal solution of this problem is to maximize merchant's profits at the expense of consumer surplus. So how do you achieve this outcome? You, the platform, will choose to fully disclose whatever uh, uh, information it has in its database to the merchant. As a consequence of this, the merchant will be able to perfectly price discriminate each consumer in the database, and therefore consumer surplus for consumers inside the database is going to be zero. Additionally, in this case, we can show that the equilibrium prices, which if you remember I told you before, are equal to the values from the perspective of the platform are equal to uh, the values from the perspective of the planner. So it is as if the planner and uh, the platform's way of valuing these data records is aligned. Now let's go back to the problem of, uh, of the consumer. The consumer has to decide whether to sell or not uh, uh, her record. If she sells the record, what does she get? She gets a monetary compensation plus an expected payout. However, in this case, I told you that she's gonna get price discriminated, so the expected payoff is zero. Therefore, all that the consumer gets in this case when selling, it's the price, P star. I told you before that this price is equal to the value from the perspective of the planner. That's what happens if she sells. If she doesn't sell, she gets the outside option, R1. But now you understand that the consumer sells, if the consumer sells, it must be that this is higher than this, that the price she gets is higher than the outside option, but the price is equal to the uh, planner's value and therefore this equality must be correct. But this inequality, this condition really as a whole is exactly the condition I was told, telling you in the previous slide. So this is correct, this is, this is satisfied. And conversely, if the consumer, if some consumers of type omega do not sell, it must be that this outside option is weakly higher than uh, the uh, than the price, but the price is equal to the planner's value. So therefore, we have this condition, and therefore, again, we are satisfying the previous, the second condition in this proposition. Summing up together, altogether, what we conclude is that all equilibrium in this case are constraint efficient. What happens? In the other case, the case in which the pla uh, the platform cares relatively more about the the uh, payoff of the of the consumers, in this case, uh, the platform is in different curve are steeper, and the solution of the problem is going to be at this kink. Now, you may think you may notice there is also the case in which they are equal. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, um, uh, you know, uh, qualitatively, the, the answer is going to be very similar. So, let me focus on. On the on this on this uh, case in which uh, gamma u is strictly higher than gamma pi, so the optimal solution is going to be that extreme point. Um, how does the platform achieve that extreme point? It's going to choose an information structure that involves some information withholding. That is to say, it's going to pool different types of consumers in the same market segment, so that the so that the merchant will not be able to. In, uh, entirely tell who's who. In this way, the consumer surplus is going to be positive. And how is that consumer decide whether or not they sell, to sell their data? Well, uh, as before, the consumer decide the decision of whether to sell their data depend on how much uh, what's the compensate what compensation they get the price, plus their expected trading surplus. The planner's decision instead in this case, depends, again, on the planner's value for this data. But this planner's value for the, for the data is equal to the sum of the prices, which are the marginal value from the perspective of the platform, plus the consumer's marginal surplus, as opposed to the consumer expected surplus. Uh, and, and whenever there is pooling uh, in equilibrium, 
the expected consumer surplus and the marginal consumer surplus, meaning how much consumers is adding marginally to the total uh, consumer surplus, uh, may differ. And this discrepancy will, will imply that the planner's decision and the consumer's decision may not be the same, and this leads to an inefficiency. Um, let me skip this slide. Um, and let me just... Sorry, add... I just asked, uh, in the previous case, in the yeah, gamma please. use small case, um, yeah, do we case. also, yeah, right here, uh, do we also get social efficiency in the sense of, like, like, so, so you fully reveal the omega, and so, uh, I see, but is it that you sell the record if and only if your omega is, like, smaller than, sorry, larger than our, our omega? You sell, sorry, you sell the record uh, if and only if. If and only if omega is as large as, yeah. So what's the difference between the psi Q star omega and, and just omega? Because uh, it will be fully revealed, right? Yeah. Um, or, or am I missing something? So very good. So we actually can uh, analytically compute this uh, psi of omega. Uh, and it was in my slide uh, in an earlier version, longer version of this talk, which I deleted for this talk. And uh, when we have this assumption, this psi uh, is gamma pi times omega. And Tianhao here can correct me if I'm wrong. Gamma pi times omega. So it's not quite omega, as you were, as you oh, were uh, impl see. implying, but it's gamma pi times omega. Because this is the value for, um, sorry, sorry, because of this equality, this is the value for the platform. Uh, and the platform I values I see. the platform values the profit that the merchant makes with discounted by gamma pi. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, it answers your question. I, but yeah. I don't know how. Yeah. yeah no. No. My, my my question was simply what's the gap between this and social efficiency to try to maximize you know consumer plus producer. But I guess in that case, if gamma pi is one, then it will be exactly. socially efficient, right? Because exactly. you will be but here. Yes, the only exactly. gap is. Like it, it's a scam of high time thing that this may yeah. cause yeah. you to incorrectly choose to sell or not sell. Like that's, that's to exactly R right. We, we, that's exactly right. When gamma pi is equal to one, it means that the platform fully internalizes the merchant's profit, uh, and so you have you don't have the um, the what I call the destructing additional source of efficiency. The, and so you get social you get social efficiency, social constraint efficiency. Okay, so uh, one thing, one small thing. Um, uh, so I have 12 more minutes, right? In terms of time. Yeah. Um, so perhaps I can go quickly through this slide. Uh, this is a more informal and in perhaps um, more informal way of describing what's going wrong. Uh, and uh, the idea that I, that, uh, I would like to channel is the fact that when the platform cares relatively more about the consumer surplus. The platform pulls consumers of different types. That I already said that. Uh, it pulls consumers of different types in the same uh, segment. Uh, in that case, the, the exact composition of that segment that determines the merchant's belief about uh, who's the consumer that uh, uh, he sees in front in front of uh, of uh, in front of him. Uh, and therefore, it determines which is the fee that the merchant will find it optimal to charge to this pool uh, of consumers. Uh, your decision as a consumer to sell or not your data affects the pool composition, the composition of the pool, and therefore affects the merchant's beliefs, uh, and therefore affects the fee that the merchant charges to these uh, consumers in the pool, and therefore affects the payoff of all these consumers in the pool. So your decision to sell or not affects the payoff of other consumers. This is an externality. Uh, and, and the externality, which kind of goes back to our previous paper, and this externality is, is uh, at the heart of uh, the inefficiency that we see um, in, in this economy. And notice that the externality is only active when the platform pulls. If the platform doesn't pull, this externality is, is not there. It's just not there because the... the uh, perhaps I can, if, if you're interested, I can explain, but let me not go into this right now. So this is an additional piece of, 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 uh, of intuition. Uh, let me just advertise, uh, you know, a, a corollary of uh, all these things, all these propositions that I told you so far. 
you may you may have noticed that uh, our result here is saying that under some condition equilibria can be inefficient. Uh, can we do a little bit more? Can we do can can we do better than this? Um, we we can uh, apply this general characterization I told you before to find uh, stronger sufficient conditions under which when um, constraint efficiency requires some trading, that is to say, uh, the economy requi requires some non-trivial trade to happen in order to achieve efficiency, um, we can uh, uh, find a stronger sufficient condition under which it's not that equilibria can be inefficient, but all equilibria are inefficient. Okay. So, um, Let me uh, skip the example, okay? Um, so the example here just illustrates uh, this inefficiency, goes into the details of this inefficiency in the context of a two-type economy. Um, but let me not go through this um, and shows that all equilibria are inefficient. What I wanted to focus attention on in the last 10 minutes is uh, the positive part of the paper. So after having um, a knowledge that this economy can uh, lead uh, can be inefficient. Uh, we we ask ourselves how can we fix this market failure, and uh, we explore three alternative uh, ideas. Uh, two of which are very standard, one of which is, is slightly less so. The first idea is uh, the idea of introducing uh, introducing data taxes. The second idea is the one of introducing data unions, and the last is the one of of making data markets more complete. I'll, I'll go through these ideas one after the other. Uh, let me start from data taxes. Uh, we introduce uh, in this economy a simple data tax on consumers. That is to say, when uh, a consumer sells her record, the consumer has to pay a tax, T omega, which could be negative. In that case, this should be interpreted as a subsidy. We show that uh, any constraint efficient outcome can be supported by an equilibrium of the competitive economy with these taxes, with taxation. Let me, let me present the result uh, in a more formal way. Fix any constraint efficient outcome, the database and the, and the mechanism. There exists an equilibrium of the competitive economy um, that supports this outcome. So, so Q and X are part of this equilibrium. Uh, and is a tax schedule, which is defined as uh, in this way. I'll, I'll come back and comment on this in a second, but we can we can you know constructively define this tax uh, such that this equilibrium supports uh, the constraint efficient outcome. Therefore, uh, consumer welfare in this case is maximized, and this result does not depend on the preferences of the platform. So regardless of the platform preferences, we achieve efficiency. Moreover, the tax is, is balanced in the sense that the government doesn't have to spend more money than the one it, uh, it collects from taxation. Why is this result true? Let's go and look inside the definition of this tax. Imagine moving the tax on the right-hand side and moving this object here, the psi, on the left-hand side. What is the right-hand side of this resulting equation? I argue it is the expected payoff, net payoff, that the consumer gets when it sell, when she sells her data. Why? The first uh, component is just the expected payoff from interacting with the merchant. The second component is the com monetary compensation, the price E the consumer receives from the platform. And the third, components, uh, the third component, minus the tax, is the tax that the consumer has to pay to the government for selling her data. Uh, on the right hand side, on the on the left hand side, we would have this psi, and this I was telling you is the uh, value of a, of moving a data record from consumer to the platform from the perspective of the planner. Uh, this shows that when we introduce this tax, uh, consumer now are able to internalize the social where social here is quote unquote because it's, uh, it's consumers plus uh, platform, the social benefit of uh, selling their data. And this is why uh, this economy achieves uh, efficiency, constraint efficiency. So this is the idea of uh, introducing a data tax. 
A second so idea. I, so, you know, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Question. When, when people, they like general equilibrium and they have like externalities in general equilibrium, there was this idea of like Lindau taxes or whatever. It, yeah. it, is that like an example of a Lindau? Is this an example of a Lindau tax or is that so, so we explored um, uh, Lindau taxes uh, in, in, in the last, this is going to be the last, uh, the last uh, extension we do. But unlike those taxes, these taxes are simple. At least, you know, my, my, my view is that they're simple in the sense that they only depend on the type of the record and don't depend on how this record is used, which is which would be something that emerges in, uh, uh, in a Lindell economy. So, so to me, when we found this result, this to me was good news because it seems that the tax that is needed to correct the inefficiency of gray light is, is not uh, overly, overly complicated to, to implement. I'll, I'll come back to Lindell in, uh, in, uh, in a second. Uh, wonderful. So uh, second idea is the, the idea of a data union. Uh, this is one, one slide only. So I'm getting, I'm getting there. Um, we designed a data union that operates as follows. The idea of data unions has been kind of floating around uh, in, in books and kind of, uh, you know, there is this very interesting paper by, by many co-authors uh, that has been published on law, law journal last year. And, um, and the way we formalize this data union is as follows. Uh, a data union is an intermediary that sits between consumers and platform and uh, manages the data of the consumer on their behalf. Uh, consumers voluntarily participate in the union. Uh, so it has to be that they all decide to sell their data to sell their data to the union as opposed to the platform. Uh, and then the union uh, uh, sells a part of its database or perhaps all of it to the platform, but now the union has market power. It's a, it's a price maker. Uh, it sells the uh, database, a subset of all the data it has to the platform. And it and it does so uh, by choosing a price that extracts entirely the platform's payoff. And the platform payoff, as we know, is V of, v of Q. So the platform still makes no money. The union makes all the money that there is, V of Q and then distributes uh, the proceeds, V of Q, back to the consumers in the form of a data dividend, if you want. So you, it, it distributes all that, it, all that it receives from the platform back to all the consumer, including the consumers that uh, whose data may have not been sold uh, to the platform. And it does so in a way that it guarantees participations of consumers uh, in the first place. Now, the result that we have is that uh, equilibria, all equilibria of this economy in which we have this data union are constraint efficient and therefore maximize consumers' welfare, uh, regardless again of the platform's incentive. The last bit, uh, the last alternative market design that we consider is an alternative design that goes back to the uh, idea of, of uh, Lindell. You know, there are many economies with uh, externalities you can you can uh, achieve efficiency in this economy by making markets more complete. Here, more complete means that uh, uh, consumers are allowed to trade uh, the way the records are used by the platform. So there's going to be a market uh, in which I can sell records of type omega for an intended use little a. This market will have a posted price, which now is a more complex object. It's a kind of object that depends on the type of record and how this record is intended to be used. Uh, this adapts to our setting the standard approach of modeling economies and externalities from, from, uh, from GE, from the GE tradition. Uh, it is kind of reminiscent, if you want, of uh, recent regulation from Europe in which uh, the specific purposes, the regulation says that the specific purposes for which personal data are used should be determined at the time of, of collection. So there is a parallel to that uh, kind of regulation. These markets are efficient. In fact, they're efficient. In fact, they're not just constraint efficient, but they're also unconstrained efficient. So this solution is really uh, kind of, uh, you know, a canon is really not just achieving unconstrained efficiency, but achieving constraint, uh, unconstrained efficiency. But of course, you know, the realism of the solution has, uh, is kind of questionable because it requires uh, markets, that, many markets, and these markets have to be uh, the, yeah, it requires a lot of a lot of fine tuning. Um, I'm just going to skip the monopsonist platform, and I'm going to conclude. Uh, so, what do we do in this paper? We 
present study a stylized framework uh, of a competitive uh, markets uh, market for personal data. The framework is rooted in a G tradition, as you saw, uh, but it also leverage on recent progress in the from the information design literature. Uh, the main uh, one of the main result of the paper is to emphasize a novel market failure, uh, the platform's role as an information intermediary, the fact that it's trying to balance, um, uh, you know, the uh, you know, conflicting interests between consumers and merchant, enables an externality that leads the market towards inefficiency, that can lead the market uh, towards an inefficiency. And then uh, we propose three alternative market designs that, that fixes an efficiency, the introduction of data taxes, the introduction of a data union, and uh, the idea of uh, making markets uh, more complete, uh, like in a Lindal economy. So that's all that I had uh, that I wanted to say, and I wanted to thank you for, for, your, for your time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacobo. Um, before opening the floor to the audience, I want to maybe ask first Kevin whether he has any comments. Um, yeah, so maybe one broader uh, question here is sort of, as you mentioned in the introduction, we are in a world where either data is bartered away for consumer, either it's bartered away or they're not compensating anyway for the data. Um, given that's the current world we live in, I guess, how do you want us to think about this paper that imagines a different world where we have, you know, I, I guess we're not, you know, we're largely not living in a world of competitive market for data, much less one with, you know, these other like Lindau economy, these complicated um, things. Yeah. Like, uh, is, is the idea that we should be in the future moving towards such a world or? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. And the way I... I... I think about this is that uh, we, you know, we have this uh, world that that doesn't doesn't uh, strike us as, as as some an arrangement that would lead to inefficiency. So we can sit down and hypothesize about a perfect situation uh, or or a seemingly perfect situation in which uh, uh, consumers are given ownership, trades become possible, and platforms don't have market power, so they're competing very fiercely with each other and think okay that is that the world we sh we we should go uh, we should move move forward to and the paper says well actually that world also suffers from inefficiencies uh, and so uh, so so that's sort of the contribution of the paper is 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 to say that even a world that may look perfect on paper uh, may actually suffer from from inefficiency i see so so i guess if i compare this to the world where uh the platform chooses the prices that world is at least more that world is more efficient in terms of the the constrained notion of efficiency at yeah. the cost of i guess consumer welfare yeah yeah, because... yeah. So, very good yeah so you're mentioning a result that uh, i have not uh discussed that the result in which the platform has market power and can set prices uh not in a competitive way that world uh achieved con achieves constraint efficiency so if constraint efficiency is all that we care about then that's good, but unfortunately, in that world, consumer surplus is uh, is minimal, as you're saying, um, and so and so, you know, uh, so we we kind of have to navigate the trade off of whether we care about the distribution of uh, of uh, of welfare or, or or whether we just care about the sum, and if we care about the sum, that's a solution that uh, that works. That's the case of the monopsonist platform that I skipped at the end. And, and yeah, just I looked, I looked at the paper ahead of time, but I just wanted to understand the, the interpretation. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, another common thing is that we also started uh, an ex expropriation economy where uh, the, the the platform does not take does not sell prices but directly uh, have the, the ownership of data. So we show we show in that case uh, uh, the economy is also highly inefficient. So if that's the benchmark we are compared to, then uh, you know both are inefficient. It's hard to say you know which is better. So that's also part of the paper. Okay, great. And uh, Titong? Uh, yes, I, I, I could comment a couple of things. So first of all, the you know the exonerative point is like a very general. I think it's pretty interesting. That whenever the platform has incentive to poor consumers, right? That kind of exonerity is there. So for example, you although I know that model is very hard to solve, for example, you have a competing sellers there, okay? 
In that case, we don't know how to characterize the full welfare triangle yet. Okay, the frontier mm -hmm. may be nonlinear, but mm -hmm. even in that case, perhaps more likely, you know, the uh, the platform is going to uh, pull consumer types together. So whenever there's a cooling there, you know, your axonarity point uh, is there. So uh, I like that that generality, you know, because some people may complain, oh, in the platform case, usually there's multiple sellers of the same product there. They're competing with each other. And we know, you know, uh, with monopoly price discrimination or competitive price discrimination, sometimes the welfare impact can be very different. But in terms of your externality inefficiency point, actually is not that sensitive to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to that market structure, right? So that, that uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other one, I was wondering, you know, uh, uh, why you use, when you the platform offer prices to the consumer, uh, the, the, the price is individualized, like the data price, right? Of course, people may, think, oh, why not consider uniform price first? That's easy to implement in the reality, right? I give you yeah. $10 per month. Let me just track your transaction on my platform. But of course, I guess from theory point of view, you just want to make your inefficiency outcome sharper. Because if we have uniform data price, there's yeah. another yeah. you know, inefficient thing can, can arise, I guess, right? Yeah. So, so, so obvious one. So yeah, now so, you make the personalized price actually want to make the inefficiency point sharper even, right? We just shut shut down that channel first, right? Yes, is that, so, is that the right? Is that right? So I mean, uh, I share with exactly the same intuition with you, um, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that uh, when prices are allowed are rich enough in the sense that they're allowed to depend on the type of data, we have we can have an inefficiency. Uh, we show that when prices are much richer, that is to say they're allowed to depend not just on the type of data, but also on the intended use, then mm -hmm. the economy achieves efficiency in the spirit of uh, making markets more complete, a la Lindell. You are thinking about going in the opposite direction, exactly. making, making prices less rich, the price system less rich, in particular, a price system which is a single price that doesn't mm -hmm. depend on anything. Uh, I suspect that uh, you're just going to create more uh, instances more of, uh, right. of, uh, of inefficiency. But that's an interesting benchmark we have not studied. Uh, clearly, you know, there is a trade-off. It's simpler to implement, but as we suspect, as you're saying, it may generate uh, further uh, externalities. Uh, it mm -hmm. would be actually interesting to study this uh, this economy and, and, and see uh, how, how much worse it is from the one that we have written down. So uh, w one more question. That's like when I read like. By the way, so can I can I just say one one detail is that okay, uh, sure. interestingly in some of the lawsuits that uh, have, uh, are happening these days about uh, compensating consumers from uh, like Facebook is involved in a couple, um, these lawsuits do account for uh, how long you have been on the platform. So if you if you've been on the platform for for five years, you're going to be entitled for a for a larger compensation, so a larger price. Mm -hmm. If you've been on the platform for a short amount of time, you're 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 going to be entitled for a short for a smaller compensation. So those prices depend on something in that in this real world case, uh, and uh, and uh, you know it, there is a little bit of a parallel. I don't know how much uh, um, compelling the parallel is, but it's just. Uh... So uh, go back to like in the paper, not in your presentation. Yeah. It's like the monopoly case, right? Then yeah. one monopoly firm is a price maker. Yeah. In that case, you argue the, the outcome is constrained efficient, okay? But, you know, one thing I haven't thought through yet is, you know, the the axonarity about the data disclosure choice is also there if if the outcome is, is not like a full disclosure to, to the seller. Uh, but but why the, the, I haven't figured out the intuition. So why in the monopoly case, perhaps it's a silly question, why in the yeah. monopoly case, you know, uh, that that's not going to pooling, you know, but the axonarity is still there, and we don't have inefficiency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But in the comp perfect competitive case, we have. A, so, what's the exact intuition? I haven't fully. Yeah, understood. yeah, yeah. So let me try to explain, and I think this is something um, we have to sharpen. But uh, my intuition for wh why um, what you say it's true is that in the monopsonies problem. Uh, the, uh, the the platform chooses prices in such a way 
that it makes consumers exactly indifferent between participating and not participating in the in the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, as a consequence of this, uh, the, pla the platform then can break ties on behalf of consumers and decide who's going to participate and who's going to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to do so to maximize its own profit. Uh, the, the, this, you know, it's going to make all consumers uh, uh, kind of anchor to their uh, outside option R, and then it's going to maximize uh, the profit, uh, the, the payoff of the platform. In this world, um, the, pl the platform is solving uh, the coordination problem on behalf of the consumers. In the competitive mm -hmm. markets, instead, nobody is solving this problem on their behalf. Consumers have to decide on their own, do I participate or not? And that's when the decision to participate, uh, uh, when it creates an externality, that's when you, you, you generate inefficiency. In the case of the platform, the platform makes everybody in different, sorry, in the case of the monopsonist platform, the, the platform makes everybody's in the, everybody indifferent and then says, you sell to me, you don't sell to me, you sell to me. I so it solves it. the coordination yeah. problem that we have. This mm -hmm. is the way I think about it. Uh, perhaps there is a better, uh, sharper intuition to, to provide, but uh, I hope this this is at least partially useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions by anybody else from the... Uh, from the audience, maybe you can stop sharing the screen. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, I mean, I had one question. I don't know if, if it's covered already about. Uh, so, for example, so if I'm the platform and, uh, you know, there's a lot of correlation between the data of consumers. Uh, how, you know, how does this play a role in your model? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Yes, yeah, and I, I should have said this, but uh, in this uh, in this paper, uh, consumers' uh, data records are not correlated. Uh, in particular, uh, the, when the platform obtains one data record from, from a consumer, that does not teach the platform anything about the other uh, records. Um, so the data records are uncorrelated, and this is an assumption we make to uh, emphasize a distinction from... Uh, Another externality that has been identified by the literature earlier, this is what I refer to as the learning externality, which instead stems precisely from this exogenous correlation. Uh, so the, paper mess the paper's message here is, even in the world in which data consumer, uh, consumers' data are uncorrelated, and so that externality is, is shut off, um, you can still have failures uh, and these failures come from a different uh, mechanism. It's, they're coming from these pooling uh, externalities that we try to illustrate, that we try to illustrate in this paper. Okay, so with the learning would be even worse, I guess, right? The, the... With, with the, if you add correlation, then, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, that's a model we haven't solved, uh, but the, the, our, our, um, our um, idea here is that you're just adding problems uh, to... Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so the so the idea here is that the, these two externalities can be compl complementary and, and then contribute to uh, overall uh, inefficiency. Okay, great. So uh, we'll stop uh, the live broadcast now. We'll just uh, stay for a few minutes uh, uh, offline. So thank you very much, Jacopo, and the speakers uh, and the thank panelists you. for all the questions. Coming. And uh, we hope to see you again in uh, twenty twenty four for our next uh, few series. Um...